Uh, next week we're out, is that right? Correct. Yes, sir. Uh, when we come back, we, we'll be doing a new lab. We'll be doing the uh, Vidic lab. Uh, it is a group lab. Um, okay. Have a new handout. Any questions about the material? How are we doing on nomen with nomenclature? Alpine's ketones. We'll have a quiz on Friday. Today's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. We'll have a quiz on Friday. We'll have a covered through today. Um, it means enemies. <coughs> Um, special type of imines, hydrozones, oxines, 2,4 DNP derivatives, chemical test for aldehydes or ketones, no precipitate given with other carbonyl compounds such as esters or amides. Precipitate. Uh, Wolf Kishner, that's right, Mr. Wolf. Uh, pretty straightforward mechanism once we saw it. We make the hydrozone, and then it's a sequence of removing the H from nitrogen resonance and putting it back on carbon. And ultimately eliminating nitrogen gas. Fairly straightforward. It does require a good amount of heat. Uh, these conditions, at like 200, 300 degrees, it can be sort of uh, harsh conditions. Uh, some, some starting materials may have survived that harsh condition. It's a classical way to remove the carbonyl, basically deoxygenate. And we saw this in the Frito Crafts acylation reduction sequence. The, other, the alternative to the Wolf Kishner was, again, the Clemenson reduction. Uh, okay, any questions up to this point? Um, that's right, Mr. Wolf. Anybody know where that came from? CSI Miami. You ever watch that show? You'd <laughs> always get it. That's right, Mr. Wolf. Okay. Strecker amino acid synthesis. We're still under amines. Uh, you'll likely see this in biochemistry. Uh, we can make an amino acid this, uh, from an aldehyde or ketone, typically an aldehyde. Uh, KCN and ammonium chloride. Uh, these are both solids. Which is a good thing. Basically this is an ammonia source. And the cyanide source. And cyanide is a little bit basic. It's, it'll, it'll deprotonate the ammonium and all this in equilibrium here. Uh, but we have an amine here. What are we going to get with the amine and the aldehyde? That's right, imine, right? Yeah. There's the imine that's formed. You know the mechanism for that. But then the cyanide reacts with the imine. How can it react? Well, just like a carbonyl, C double bond N is just like a C double bond O. It's polarized. Okay. Nucleophiles will add to C double bond N just like C double bond O. And the cyano group, nucleophilic addition to the ME. What does that give? Electrons up. Uh, this is going to give
that there. You can do this mechanism two different ways. It all depends on if we really have an H plus catalyst. Uh, is this acidic enough to serve as a catalyst? If so, we could have propagated the imine first. Then when we add the cyano group, electrons up, this is, it would be neutral in H2. If we do it this way, this has to pick up an H. Well, we can pick it up from ammonia, ammonium. Uh, the electrons take an H from ammonium. And what does that do? Ultimately, we get that there. Again, we could have did this another way. If we could have protonated something over here using ammonium. I elected here to protonate it later. Okay? Because is ammonium chloride really a strong acid? Um, it's an acidic salt. Well, it's a salt made from ammonia and a strong acid. Okay. Uh, so really it's making the imine, right? And then we do a simple nucleophilic addition with a proton to give this here. If under my if that was an OH instead of an NH2, what would that be? A cyanohydrin. We made those before. Cyanohydrins would be made by just adding cyanide to this with an H plus catalyst. But here essentially we have ammonia as well. And with ammonia we make the imine first, and then we essentially add HCN. This is H plus essentially. I think it's H plus and that's CN. So make the imine first, then you add the HCN. And we get this. But that's a nitrile group, and it can be hydrolyzed, right? It's an acid derivative. That's an acid, acidic hydrolysis. And what is the nitrile converted to? Carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid. It's first converted to the primary amide, then on to the carboxylic acid. But here we go. And what is this? <coughs> it's an amino acid. It's an alpha amino acid because the amine is at the alpha position. We can make alpha amino acids this way. And this is your R group here. And you know your amino acids vary in the R group. You can just have various aldehydes to start with would vary your R group. What's your favorite amino acid? Proline? Because it has a ring? Yeah. Did Perling have a ring? The R group is a ring, right? I don't remember. Okay. Uh, that's close to phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is CH2 phenyl, right? So it's missing the CH2. But you could, of course, just use this aldehyde. Just have the CH2 in there, and we could make phenylalanine by this route. Called the Strecker amino acid synthesis. Imine, though. Make the imine, and then we add in essentially ACN to the imine. You can show a synthesis of leucine this way. about that. Uh, C, no, E. We're still under imines, right? Mm -hmm. Lots of applications of imines. Imines, reductive amination. <coughs> A great, great way to indirectly add alkyl groups to amines. Uh, we've looked at such before. Direct alkylation of amines is difficult. 
We saw that in organic one near the end because you are prone to getting polyalkylation. Uh, we saw the use of azides in organic one to make primary means using azide as a nucleophile and then reduction of the azide to the primary mean. We saw the use of cyanocyanides. SN2 reduced to cyano group, primary mean. Gabriel synthesis, yeah? A way to make a primary amine. All those are indirect ways of basically alkylating ammonia. We're making primary means by non-direct alkylation methods. They always only get primary means. This way gives primary, secondary, or tertiary very versatile on a reductive amination sequence. Starts with an aldehyde or ketone and an amine. But we're going to end up adding another alkyl group to this amine. This nitrogen has one alkyl group. This nitrogen now has two. Now we do not use, if we try to directly alkylate this generic substrate, we would need to use something like benzyl chloride. And we can do a SN2. We would need to use a base or something to pick up the ACL that could be formed here. That would be a theoretical direct alkylation using a uh, doing an SN2. And that's what we have said is has problems because you can get polyalkylation because the product can then alkylate again. In the Gabriel synthesis we used we used that, but we use it a emmet here. Or we used azide here, and then we reduced the azide. Or we used cyanide here, and then we reduced the cyanide. Here we are using the amine, but instead of an alkylating agent doing an SN2, we react the amine with aldehyde or ketone. What does this give? Aldehyde or ketone amine, what does that give? Amine, right? There you go. There's your amine. Place the oxygen with the nitrogen. Imine, that's what we've been doing here. Well, the imine, the double bond CN can be reduced. And if we reduce this, that's going to become CH2 and that's going to become NH. CH2, NH, I've just turned it. This CN pi bond can be reduced with hydrogen, plate on carbon, just like reducing an alkene, carbon-carbon double bond. <coughs> or it can be reduced with sodium borohydride. Mechanism for hydrogenation is just, you know, the two H's are being shot in from the metal surface like darts. There's really no mechanism. It's not ionic. Same old pi bond hydrogenation. Here, though, we have a more of an ionic mechanism. Sodium borohydride is a source of H minus, correct? We have a polarized pi bond. H minus adds here, electrons up. And we're going to get, there's now two H's on that carbon. One, two, electrons up. And so nucleophilic addition to the imine gives that. We need an H. Where could the H come from? Sodium borohydride. Sodium borohydride. And we need an H plus. Did he, it, is, or can you use aluminum bor? You said like, is, doesn't it, it, it just keep re reducing it down? But does it keep releasing H's? Keeps releasing hydride. Yeah. We don't need hydride oh, now. Um, we, need, we don't need H minus. Um, and 
This will not react with H minus to give that. You'll have two minuses then. Uh, we need H plus. Water. Water. Work up. Work up. Uh, you can then add in water as a work up. I don't know that we've ever said this, but you can with sodium or hydride just use a protic solvent. For example, sodium borohydride and ethanol. And if you use ethanol, then you can, it will supply the proton. These electrons take the H, and you can get your H from, the, from a protic solvent. Or you can do an aprotic solvent, and after the reaction is deemed to be over, then you throw in some water or acid. But with sodium borohydride, you can do it in a protic solvent, and the protic solvent can supply the H along the way. <clears throat> with LAH, you can also do this with LAH. That's what the et cetera is. Any hydro if you use LAH, you cannot use a protic solvent. You'll start a fire. Wouldn't the ionized um, ethanol add to the amine? You mean we're going to generate this as well? Yes. And the alkoxide add to the imine? Couldn't it? You could. What would that give? This here? Mm hmm. And then what? And then it could take another H from an ethanol. Okay. So basically make this neutral NH? Yes, sir. That's not going to be isolated. Okay. Because you have a leaving group. And these electrons are going to kick this back off. Oh, okay. This way. Is this way reversible? Are we going to kick an H back off? No. Example of a non-reversible reaction. Hydride. When hydride adds to something, we lost the here. If hydride adds to a carbonyl, non-reversible. But if and a carbonyl in this is analogous to the enemy. Okay, this also applies to enemies. Reversible reactions, when nucleophile can act as a leaving group, or well, the O-ethyl can act as a leaving group, okay? and then reduce it, that's a reduction, right? We're adding these H's, we're going from the pi bond down to the single bond, okay? Essentially, two H's are being added. We can add it by these two H darts or, or this ionic approach where we have an H minus and then we need an H plus or H plus source, something we can just take an H plus from. 
Uh, what have we done? Nitrogen. Here it's primary. Now the nitrogen is secondary. And we've added another alkyl group and we have thus alkylated the nitrogen. But it was indirectly. We didn't use an alkylating agent like, uh, like this for an SN2. We used an outer hydrogen ketone. And we made the imine, and then the imine was reduced. And this ended up being thus an alkyl group here. Very versatile because you can make primary, secondary, or tertiary amines this way. Amines from imines. Reduction of an imine. Analysis to reduction of a carbonyl. For example, if we treated this over here with sodium borohydride and ethanol, what would we get? Yeah, it'd just be the alcohol, right? There's a new H on the carbon, there's a new H on the oxygen. Hydride adds, electrons up, and then the oxygen anion picks up a proton. So that's just reduction of a C double bond O, where this is reduction of a C double bond N. <coughs> Reductive amination, very important sequence. Uh, Kind of surprising it doesn't have a uh, person's name associated with it. Uh, it is just as important as a lot of name reactions we might have seen. Um, okay. I should have showed this as two different steps. You can do this. You, we can isolate the amines. Previous page at the bottom. We can isolate the amine. And then you can later reduce it. Could we do this sequence with everything mixed together? All combined. What do we have here? I see we can make an imine. No. This would make the imine, right? It's a cyclohexane. And the imine will have a methyl group. And this will be just an H. And by the way, my imine, the methyl could be on this side with the H, the H and the methyl being cis. But that's a pi bond, it can't rotate. I can also show the methyl on the other side. I'm, not gonna, I'm only going to show it one way, but we have stair chemistry that's possible there, the imine. But here, this is not going to be isolated because now we have the hydrogenation. This becomes CH2, that becomes NH methyl. CH2, NH methyl. And you can do that just all combined. Yes. So the difference is just that you don't get the intermediate. Like you can't isolate the intermediate. Well, you would not be trying to isolate it here. If you're going to do it all combined, you're not going to isolate the intermediate. As soon as the intermediate is formed, the hydrogen there is going to reduce it. I'm, I'm waiting for the question though. Question. You won't reduce the aldehyde? Thank you. Yes. Would this reduce the aldehyde? And the answer is typically no. Imines are much easier to reduce than carbonyls with hydrogenation. Carbonyl is a stronger bond. The only carbonyls that reduce easily with hydrogenation are ones that are conjugated with a benzene ring. If this was aromatic, the carbonyl would reduce very easily and you would not be able to do it. And that would be like the second step of the friedel crafts acylation reduction. Good question though. I was waiting for it. Very important. This works. On the other hand, this down here, which sort of looks like the same thing, combining, I'm going to make the same, this is, just, this is the ketone, it doesn't matter. This does not work. Why is this not going to work? Because... It would be reduced. Do right? The 
sodium borohydride. Sodium borohydride, which look, it looks like is being included to reduce the imine, sodium borohydride will reduce this. And this is going to give, after appropriate workup, the alcohol. Again, hydrogen will not reduce the starting ketone or aldehyde. It can be done combined that way. Now, typically will not. We can, you got it, okay. That's come. This you cannot do. This will certainly reduce this. And this will probably reduce it before you can even get your ending made. But never fear. There is a reagent that will work and we can do it all combined. Instead of using sodium borohydride, use sodium cyanoborohydride. This will work, and we can do it all combined here. They might say, if this worked, why not just do it like this? Well, this requires a tank of hydrogen gas, which is not always that commonly found. Well, this is a solid reagent that's much easier to come by and store and is more likely to be around. Okay? But it's a much more convenient option. What is sodium cyanoborohydrate? First off, what's the charge of the cyanoborohydrate? Negative. Negative, because sodium is plus. How do we get a negative out of here? It's a boron with three H's. That's not negative. But it's also got a cyano group bonded to it. And the boron is negative. So, so one of the H's of borohydride is replaced with the cyano group. And this is a known compound. There's the salt here. Now, with the cyano group there, instead of an H, is that going to be more or less reactive than if it was an H? It's going to be more reactive. Well, the cyano group is electron withdrawing because of the, the nitrogen there. That's going to help stabilize the boron anion. And the anion is not as mad being minus. So it's not as mad being minus, it's not as eager to shoot out these H minuses. Okay. So it's a, a weaker hydride source. Will not reduce the carbonyl. It turns out it will only reduce the imi. So, you don't have to worry about it reducing your starting material. It won't react with the starting material. This reacts and makes imine, and once you make imine, then the imine gets reduced to the amine, or amine. And this is a very common sort of reaction in organic chemistry is a reductive amination using sodium cyanoborohydride and an amine. And I would actually recommend considering this in your synthesis of fentanyl. I didn't give you the handout again, I gave it to you during test three, but the synthesis of fentanyl you should be looking at and considering this reaction. Again, reductive amination. What type of products do you make for reductive amination? Secondary. Hmm? Secondary. 
or primary or tertiary, any, I mean. Uh, we've just made secondary here because we used a primary amine. All my examples have been primary amines and we end up with the secondary. But if you start with the secondary, you're going to end up with the tertiary. If you start with ammonia, which is neither primary, secondary, or tertiary, um, you would get a primary. Which is you bump it up one. Ammonia is not primary. Ammonia is like the parent. Question. So would the intermediate be an anamine? Very good. We're, we'll get there. Yes. Very good. Because this reaction, the secondary mean can give enamine. Um, but you got to know what your reactions give, okay? One amine is being converted to another. This uses an amine, the product is an amine. But it's bumped up, it went from primary to secondary. Okay? And where did it, what was the source of the other carbon fragment? An aldehyde of ketone. Predict the products. So I got the product of the first reaction. Does the aldehyde of ketone have to be over here in the amine on the line? No. No? They're both in the same class. You form a secondary amine. When you start with primary, you go into secondary. Yeah? You recognize it to reduct contamination. We can the nitrogen first makes the double bond to the carbon of the carbonyl. The carbon of the carbonyl has a methyl, an H. If you want to draw in the H, you can do that. That used to be a carbonyl. Under my hand used to be oxygen, right? Now it's nitrogen. That's me. But the amine is going to be reduced, right? And that would give NH and another CH, and that would be however you want to draw it, NH. And then this becomes, that was ultimately just becomes an ethyl group, right? Because we we're going to have a CH2, and that takes on a new H, and the CH3, right? So ultimately, we add an ethyl here to the original amine. This fragment came from the aldehyde. Uh, you can do the second one on your own. How about the one at the bottom? Somebody got a product down here? Does it like react with itself? Would it be an alcohol? Or would it not react at all? How would you get an alcohol? I mean, you're not creating an amine. So no. we're going to make an amine. Oh, you will, okay. And so it's our sign of borohydride doesn't produce ketones, so if you didn't make an amine, you wouldn't be doing anything. going to react here. And you can do your mechanism. We're going to eventually, however many steps here, you're going to lose water. It's a, you're going to make an amine, but it's just in, intramolecular. What size ring are we making over here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six membered ring, nitrogen here, double bonded to the carbonyl carbon. And the carbonyl carbon has a methyl. <laughs> right? Isn't that the imine that you would get if this condensed with the aldehyde, with the ketone? Yes. Under my hand used to be oxygen. But now under my hand is the nitrogen. 
And then when this gets reduced, that's a six member grain. So it's just an intramolecular amine formation and that gets reduced. Uh, I take a look at the fentanyl synthesis, see if you can make use of this reaction in the, as a step in the synthesis there. Uh, we can also try to make some meth. Uh, first off, the four structures up here. Uh, top left, that's PPA, phenylpropanolamine. And if you look at the name, you see it's an amine. It's also got an alcohol, propanolamine. It's got a three carbon chain. You see the three carbon chain? And also on the three carbon chain, there's a phenyl. A phenyl propanolamine. Now it could be isomers with that, so it might need some numbers, that's a little bit common. Oh, PPA. PPA is common in diet, uh, some diet pills, and also sleep aids or non sleep aids. No dose pills, want to stay up all night. You know, these little cheap pills, you need to take caffeine, but sometimes those pills have PPA in them. PPA is a stimulant. Now, if you take PPA, if you take the OH off, that's amphetamine. Now, amphetamine, you're not going to be able to buy you know, at the gas station at the counter like, like you can no-dose pills. Okay. Amphetamine without the OH, it's less polar. And amphetamine will get into the brain easier. And it will call even, cause even more nervous system psychological effects. All right. Analogous to these two are these two. If you put a methyl on PPA, you have essentially pseudofit. And pseudofed is a decongestant because it's a stimulant. And stimulants are going to open you up and get you breathing. Okay? And you can buy pseudofed. But if you take the OH off of pseudofed, like we did over there, the difference is we have a methyl on the nitrogen. Well, if you have a methyl on the nitrogen of amphetamine, what do you have? Methamphetamine. So you can get to that by removing the oxygen of pseudofed. And this was one of the original meth lab approaches to making methamphetamine. Uh, people who wanted to do some garage chemistry would buy lots of pseudofed at, at the drugstore. Okay, you ever seen by the drugstore with like a their, their little basket? It's like filled with pseudofed. You know, like, but see. Then they stopped allowing that. So now when you go buy Sudafed, you have to ask the, the druggist for it, and you can only buy like one or two packages. A long time ago, you could go in and just buy all the packages. But, but they figured out what people were doing, because you can remove that oxygen in your garage chemistry. All right? And you can convert your Sudafed into meth. Okay? Uh, I don't know what the percent yield is in the garage or how pure the product is, uh, you know, but uh, if you 
watched Breaking Bad, do anybody ever still remember that show? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, that's one way. But they soon started making it another way on that show. Anybody remember the other way? Because they could not get suicide and you know, the other way was a reductive amination approach to making meth. There's actually two different ways. What are the two ingredients for a reductive amination approach? Uh, what are the two different starting materials? Aldehyde, amine, and then... Aldehyde or ketone, and a... Primary, or a... Some amine. And all, at the end, that amine is going to become more alkylated. Well, break that down into an aldehyde or ketone and an amine. But guess what? You can do it two different ways. Think about that. And one of the ways is what they were doing more and more on Breaking Bad. And in one episode, uh, somebody was breaking into a, a chemical place, and they were stealing, a, stealing something. And what they were stealing is one of the reagents that you should come up with by looking at this. Formic acid. Hmm? Methylamine? Yes. Yeah, they were stealing methylamine. You remember that? I don't know how you remember that. You <laughs> must have just seen it the other day. You take notes when you watch it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't want to give it away, but okay. One of them is methylamine, and on the show they were, the younger guy was stealing some methylamine, which is a gas, and he was in a tank. Uh, so he was stealing methylamine, because they were doing a reductive amination. But what else is needed there to complete that synthesis? Uh, because the, the original meth lab approach they were not able to do because they couldn't get suited to that, I don't know. Okay, so we take a look at that. Take a look at that. At F! F! Still under it means. It means pretty uh, applicable, yeah? Metabolism of drugs containing amines. Drug metabolism of amines. So in the other hand out, the one with the nomenclature. When I gave it to you, was it white or colored? It's white. Okay, because I lost mine and I had to make another. Mine's white. Uh, let's see here. Some of this we have turn over a few pages. Drugs that contain amines, when they're metabolized in the body, they're often dealkylated. Now this is the opposite of what we just did, because what we just did was an alkylation. Reductive amination is an alkylation. The process is sort of reversed. Because, for example, amphetamine here. Amphetamine in the body is oxidized and you go back to the ending. That's an oxidation, we're removing H's. The body can do that. The body is a mean, lean, oxidizing machine. Okay? The body can oxidize it. But what can happen to endings? That's an aldehyde ketone derivative. You can reverse Reversible. It. it can be reversed to the carbonyl and the amine. How? Lots of water. Because this way we remove water. <coughs> the equilibrium is driven by removing water. How do you drive it the other way? Excess water. Well, there's excess water in your body. It means you're going to break down and go back to the outer high ketone. Okay? And, what, and, and so a metabolite of amphetamine is this ketone. 
And so if you're like testing a patient for a presence of amphetamine, maybe the procedure calls for you to look for the presence of that ketone. Because maybe this happens pretty fast and you don't see amphetamine, but you can see this. And so it's sort of uh, half no brainer than or something else, but um, and so it is one metabolite. Things can be metabolite, metabolized other ways, but this is relevant to what we just have been doing because it's really the reverse of the reductive amination sequence. Because in the lab, you might react these and come this way and then reduce it, but your body takes it the other way. Make sense? Oxidized here. It's like an alcohol being oxidized through the carbonyl compound. Right? Now, does your body use like the big three oxygen or something? No, your body has special enzymes. Okay. Um. Uh, there's another example <coughs> down here. Uh, the tricyclic antidepressant, imipramine. Imipramine. Uh, one of the methyls is cleaved. When it's oxidized, you actually, uh, the nitrogen is positive because it's, it starts with, the, uh, here. If you remove H2, there's no H2 removed, but you can get such here, it is an oxidation product. But that's just going to be hydrolyzed. This is like a protonated carbonyl and then water it's going to come in here, and then you're going to keep pushing. Eventually, it's going to become double bonded to oxygen, and you're going to kick off the nitrogen. You can work through mechanism, and that's going to pick up an H when it gets kicked off, and you've demethylated it. And actually, when you take this drug, this drug is not active. This first has to happen, and this is actually the active drug. Thus, we call that a prodrug. What does pro mean? Like pro eukaryotic. Is that a term in biology? Prokaryotic? What does that mean? No, what does prokaryotic mean? Like hmm? one? Pro prokaryotic is like a single cell, like thing usually. Yeah, but why is it called prokaryotic? What does the pro mean? Early. Pro means something. Because it was discovered first? First, original, before. Okay. This is like before the drug. It's called a pro drug. It's not the actual drug, but it's something that's before and led to the drug. Why would you even have that? Like, what's the point of giving a drug that needs to be metabolized first? Why couldn't you just give them the active form? Uh, great question, but it's a, it's a great question related to drug development. Uh, there's lots of reasons you might give a pro drug. Uh, I don't know the exact example here, and sometimes it's discovered by accident. Something, for example, we've seen one before. Remember the dye? I gave you a handout, President Roosevelt's grandchild or something. Mm -hmm. It was a dye. Mm -hmm. and it turned out the dye was actually, was actually not the drug but the dye was being metabolized to sulfonylamide. Turns out the dye is, was actually a prodrug. They didn't know it. But once they discovered it, then they just started giving sulfonylamide. In other cases, though, you, you, you like prodrugs. i give you an example here. There's a, there's a medication, I think it, it's an antibiotic, commonly given to children, and it's given orally. Uh, but it's also given as a syrup because it has to be in solution. But it's, it's very bad tasting, very bitter. And you give it to a child and it's like, I'm not taking that. And you have trouble with compliance. So instead, what's given is a prodrug. And the prodrug is not bitter. And that drug can be easily taken. But when it gets in the body, it's converted to the, the thing. So the pro-drug is used to get around the bitter taste. So that's not bitter. It's not this compound. And so once you take it, then it's metabolized too. So there's lots of cases like that where the pro-drug is used instead. 
Or maybe, maybe this is not absorbed from the stomach, but the prodrug is. So you give it as a prodrug, once it's absorbed, let the body convert it to this. And so it's a tricky way to get it into the system where the original, where the active compound would not be absorbed. There's a million cases like that of why prodrugs are useful. It's a huge part of drug design. Um, Okay, uh, we're about out of time. We'll pull these together. The last main thing I see here is the Wittig reaction. It looks like Wittig, but it's, the Germans have us pronounce it as Wittig. German chemist, Wittig. Very important reaction. Uh, another one of the top 10. There's about 20, 25 top 10 reactions in organic chemistry. Wittig being one of them. We'll be doing Wittig in lab after spring break. Uh, quiz on Friday through this material. Uh, have a good day, guys. <laughs>